I'd like to thank everybody for joining. Uh, Select Dealer Service uh, it has used uh, AFIP in the past, and now we're using uh, Product Prep and Compliance Prep as our sole training platform and all of our dealer partners. Uh, we're kind, uh, kind to offer um, the feedback from Shannon Robinson of AFIP and Tevis. Uh, we have some questions that we were able to curate from our dealers and uh, one of those questions, if we can get started here, is a dealer question, and uh, they want to know how they can safeguard while conducting business in a remote or digital fashion, since many dealers are having to conduct business in this fashion and are over the phone or by email sending sensitive client information. Uh, what are the dealer's requirements for safeguarding? <laughs> So let's talk about that. I got a little sugar happy on my slideshow here. I apologize. Let me go back a couple. So when we talk about safeguarding the digital fashion, a couple, couple things we got to be aware of. People are using technology today to be more savvy and try to steal information and try to get away with stolen identities and purchasing a vehicle. So the dealer needs to use those same type of technology to help protect itself. There's a lot of technology available to the dealers. And this is not a sales call to sell those type of different systems. Just know there's a lot of systems out there that a dealership can purchase to help protect itself. But some of the things the dealer already has is a communication tool within their DMS. One of the things that we, most dealers don't think about is how much non-public information is stored on their employees' personal cell phone, personal iPad, or personal device. and for years, what have we said? You relate to the customer, be personal, give them your personal cell phone. That's not a bad thing to do, but where you cross that line is when you start to put their non-public information on your cell phone. So in the DMS, your dealer's DMS, assuming that they're paying for that service, you can text back and forth with customers. And the, one of the reasons why you wanna do that is it starts with the first thing you have to do, and that's get the customer's permission. So the first thing the customer receives is a text from the dealer's, dealer's DMS that says, are we allowed to text you, yes or no? And if they say yes, you can now text with them through that DMS. You can now have them send you driver's license, insurance cards through a secure portal. I can tell you when I leased my truck, the sales guy came to me and he said, I'm gonna give you two numbers. The first is my personal cell phone number. I, I want you to have it. We schedule test drives. If you have questions about the truck, that's the that's the number you use. But anything that has to do with the deal or anytime you're providing me documents, please use the second number. He was very clear. I do not want your personal information on my personal cell phone. And that went a long way with me from a respect level that he was very clear on where that line was. Excellent. So the first, yeah, the first thing I would say is use the dealership's system. The second thing is use technology to your advantage, right? People calling in over the over the phone, people providing you information. You can enter their their name into your DMS. You can start doing OFAC checks and red flag checks right there. Get the driver's license early on. Start that process early on before you get too far in an online or over the phone process. Verify the customer is who they are. That's a situation where those challenging questions really come into play. I know a lot of dealers will ask the out-of-pocket questions on every online or over-the-phone transaction, regardless if there's a red flag or OFAC hit or not, because they want to take those extra steps. Uh, when whoever's doing the delivery of the vehicle, make sure they're properly trained to double-check the customer's information with what you have. Is it the driver's license? Is it the same one you received? Is the insurance the same one you received? Do the addresses match? On the delivery, you need to take those ex extra steps. If you're delivering out of state, there's companies like Maverick and stuff that you can do that help with notarized on offsite deliveries to out of state locations. Yeah, we, uh, we had uh, met with Maverick to find out if there was some ways that uh, dealers that were sending or especially FedEx and to clients, uh, some of the premium stores that we have, a lot of clients are out of state. So it was something that was they were actually aware of, but I think some of the other dealerships that were not so much doing that type of business, that was a great uh, token takeaway of how to do it where it's notarized and you can feel comfortable that you're getting back something that uh, you know, in fact, the customer had signed. 
Well, and they actually, I mean, and Maverick actually carries some of the liability with that as well. I mean, yes. if I remember correctly, you know, they they go to that next level. Yeah. Um, one of, and I think, John, we were talking about this earlier when it comes to emailing information back and forth. Remember, when it comes to emailing, unless your dealership has a secure emailing portal with password required, you should not be emailing non-public information back and forth to a customer. Meaning, you don't email the customer the credit application and ask them to send it back. Those Makes are the sense. areas you have to be careful. Yeah. Anyone else have any curiosities with safeguarding customers' uh, information? So what about a, um, an employee that, uh, that gets fired or leaves involuntarily? Um, what happens then if they've got pictures and driver's license on their, on their camera? Um, and what happens then? Is a dealer liable for that? Dealer can, absolutely, the dealer can be liable for that. Um, this is why you have to have a policy in place. This is why the dealership's DMS system really becomes important because you need to have a written safeguard policy that states that the dealership employees are not allowed to have it, that, that non-public information on their personal device. And if information is sent to them, then it is automatically deleted at that time. You need to have some type of policy in place that protects the dealer from that. Um, if somebody is is being terminated or, or leaving on their own accord and you do do an exit interview, you need to have that as part of the checklist as well. This is, I think we talked about last week, everything comes down to policy and consistency. Do I have a policy in place? Am I consistently enforcing it? Am I conducting audits, right? Do I find that there is non-public information on somebody's personal device? If I find that and it violates the policy, do I document that? Do I go to my safeguards you know, uh, audit manual and show that there was a breach? Do I provide the documentation and the feedback? Am I doing my due diligence? It's, you'll hear me say it on every phone call we have. Due diligence protects the dealer almost every time. They have to show some type of due diligence. With that being said, do you believe that um, you know a cyber attack um, you know run through is as important as it is to make sure that these other safeguards are being uh, utilized? Absolutely. So I, I have a document that I will include when we send out that talks about um, that talks about what to do if you do have a data breach. I just saw a question from come in from guy. Guy, you can't really audit somebody's personal cell phone. What you can do is have a policy in place that they don't have information on there and a policy that they agree to delete any information that's immediately sent to them. And that's just signed off on in an exit interview. Makes sense. So we had a question from one of our agents um, and this is in regards to single document rule. Is this something that's specific to California? I guess, uh, what is your take if this is something that will be um, the norm in the future? So it is not specific to California, but it's not going to shock anybody that California takes it to the extreme in terms of the interpretation of it. It just is what it is. Um, and let's see if I'm, I was making some notes here. Let's see if I can find my slide here. So it's important to understand what you, some, there's a lot of states that have a single document rule. However, California is unique that everything literally has to be on one page. There are states that their single document rule is defined as multiple pages attached together that are, that are numbered. So not every definition of a single document rule automatically means it's one long page. California is the state that does take that to the extreme. And we were joking about it earlier. I mean, I, I took a photo of it one time. I think I had six or seven water bottles lined up next to it to show you the actual length of the Cal of that California document. The whole point of that single document rule was to create was to create or eliminate the lack of disclosure. Right? There's a track record with dealerships not properly disclosing the information. Anytime we see states get very specific with some additional laws or rules and regulations, it's because of things that they find that their dealers are doing that they're not comfortable with. And the lack of disclosures was a big one in California. And leasing is really what pushed California to that next level in terms of a single document. Because for you, the single document rule had been around in California for 35 years. 
and everybody just ignored it until leasing became prevalent and there was a lot of class action lawsuits or a lot of uh, attorney general action on California dealers on not properly disclosing leasing. And that's when California really started to enforce that single document rule. In terms of my opinion, I mean, I, it, it, it's way, the California document is way too long if you want my opinion. However, there are advantages to having everything on one page other than the length, the length, the big deal. But the states that have the single document rule defined as documents that are multiple pages, you know, attached together is pretty much what we find as the norm. Uh, what the states are trying to eliminate is a lack of disclosures and then signing those spot, those spot delivery contracts, right? right. Signing blank contracts. Right. That, that's the whole point of all this. Right. Um, we also had another question from one of our dealers. We asked a lot of our dealerships, are, are you using a code of ethics black? Uh, is this something that a customer can walk through the showroom and see? And one of the dealers asked the question, do I really need to do this? You know, um, part of that was, is this a way to better my already great integrity with my clients? You know, they're coming back to me because they know that I run uh, a business with integrity. And what does this sign show? Um, the majority of my clients that are that are repeat customers that came back for a reason. So let's start off with uh, what a code of ethics is. So by definition, it's a set of principles on how to conduct yourself within an organization that guide your behavior and decision making. Okay, so that's essentially what it is. So there's two schools of thought around this. One is a dealer could take an authoritarian approach where basically a code of contact is a set of rules, right, that are put in place and you're forced to adhere to. The other one is a teaming approach where essentially a code of ethics or key value elements are put in place, right, that everyone works towards and uses as guiding principles. So a code of ethics, basically what the purpose is, is it's a powerful tool uh, for dealership and management. It sets the tone of the working environment it identifies conduct that is not acceptable or is potentially illegal. And then uh, it's a guide on what to do when rules do not apply, who to contact for questions, and then also who to contact to report any misconduct. And so from a nutshell, that's basically what a, a code of ethics is for a dealer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, one of the things that I do see that may be omitted from some code of ethics is those contact points, which I think brings uh, the integrity to a next level, you know, and it especially allows you to find out if there's things that are being carried out, uh, you know, that, that you would not be happy with in your store as a, as a manager or a dealer principal. You know, does anybody have any questions in regards to things and in their own? Dealers, and as dealers are working towards being more compliant, Right. And that's essentially the end goal that they want to accomplish as they continue to do that. It really should be a teaming aspect. Right. right. Of everyone working together. If there's a problem or an issue. And this is one of the things that we've taught for years around behavioral change. If there's a problem or an issue, stand up, say something. Right. Yeah. Don't be part of the crowd that goes along with it. And then pretty soon, you know, you find that not only did one person get in trouble, but you got in trouble, too, because you didn't say anything. Right. And one of the things that Tevis and I, when we do our AFIP boot camps, we have an ethics speech that we end our boot camps with. Um, and it talks about the fact that, you know, the only way to change this industry and to make an impact is to stand up for what's right. Right. I mean, how many how many dealership personnel feel comfortable speaking up or speaking out when they see things that are happening that are that are illegal or you know, a violation of some of the rules at their dealership. Do you create a corporate culture that encourages people to speak up? And a code of ethics helps with that, as well as, not to get on a sidetrack, but I also think there needs to be a hotline that somebody can call if they feel like they need to report some actions, right? But that sets the standard for the employees and you have to hold each other accountable. And I think a good code of ethics holds each other accountable. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that culture, I think, is, is so important because everyone's on the same page towards a, you know, a common goal. And, uh, you know, departments start to act like departments and, and making sure that uh, no matter who's handling a deal or, or handling customer sensitive information, it's all done in the same way. And process, I think, plays a lot towards that as well. 
Absolutely. So I was, one thing to add is we work, there's a top 10 dealer group that we, we certify all of their finance managers and they brought in a new compliance officer three years ago. And one of the things that he did that I really uh, respected that went well is he created a compliance kind of uh, board. And as they went through and made changes, he had finance managers, finance directors. So as they created their additional code of ethics, he actually brought in employees to help write that code of ethics. So it wasn't just upper management saying these are the rules. It came from employees of as well of what they wanted those ethics to be. That's a great exercise in getting everyone involved. Does anyone else have any questions in regards to the, the ethics point? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, how should this be displayed to the public, to customers? What should uh, dealers do with this code of ethics other than to say I have it? So I put up on the screen some examples of what's in the AFIP code of ethics. I think your code of ethics, there's a lot. I mean, I've seen some that are 25 long and some that are 10 long, right? And not everyone has to be customer facing, but I think there are, uh, there's a good message sent in posting some of your code of ethics, right? That We've all been through some type of interview, some type of sales where we have to have an elevator speech, like what's the thing that I open with that sets me apart that everybody else? That's no different than posting a couple of those code of ethics somewhere within the off, within that office for the customer to see to feel comfortable as they move forward. I know a lot of finance managers that have their AFIB diploma behind them in their F&I office. And when a customer sits down, they will point to that plaque on the wall and say, let me tell you a little bit, a little bit about myself. I'm AFIP certified. That's what that plaque means. I have to adhere to a strict code of ethics and they start with an explanation, that explanation to build confidence with the customer. So I th it does build confidence. I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody here who, who says it can if the customer doesn't walk in and see those things. Yeah, the other thing, they could put that code of ethics on the website, right, or in the dealership. Again, it's a statement, kind of like a mission statement of, hey, here's the things that are important to us as an organization. Here's how we're gonna treat you. And when somebody sees that, whether it's on a wall or if they see it on your website, you know, they know or expect, hey, when I go to XYZ dealership, I expect that this is how they're going to treat me because this is their code of ethics. So you're basically setting the standard for, you know, what you expect out of your employees and what your customers can expect from you. How can a dealer get a good uh, code of ethics? Where can they access this information? Um, we can send out some information. I know we have a sister association, the Association of Dealership Compliance Officers, and I think, Tevis, what do we have? Four PowerPoints sitting around here. Uh, this is kind of a hot topic. Because uh, when we were talking to ADCO, they're doing webinars on the exact same thing, ethics versus values. I can tell you I've probably taken three or four phone calls in the last month from dealers trying to put together some ethical code of conduct. So once when uh, you send out the recording, we'll we'll send you some information to include in in that of some just examples and some good ways to kind of get started. Excellent. So yeah, you know, go right ahead. No, you know, I was, I was gonna just make uh, you know the comment that um, uh, I, I guess it's a culture, right, where it's got to come from the top down, not just uh, provide a code of ethics and say, hey, here it is, right? There should be some kind of training on this or no? What do you think? Well, I think there needs to be training and everybody needs to sign and agree and adhere to those standards. Absolutely. Yeah. And it should come from the top down, but everybody should come together, right? Like as I said, there's those two options. I think the teaming approach would be better, get your employees involved, kind of like that top 10 dealership that uh, Shannon had referenced, but get your employees involved, get them to be part of this and bring those those things to the table, everybody in their different respective departments. Nothing the, changes the if they don't the, buy in. The dealer, yeah. yeah. Right, they have to buy in. So you've got to come together. You've got to talk about it as an exciting thing that we're doing. We're trying to drive this. And what a lot of dealers can say is, to John, to your example, you have a dealer that already feels like they have that type of value and respect. And maybe they take the approach of, hey, we're known for these things. Let's make this public. Let's post it. Let's put it on paper, all the things that we're known for, and let's all sign adhere to it and push these. And let's hold each other accountable to these items. One of uh, our dealerships uses a mission statement. Do you feel that that is adequately explaining their ethics or how they want to treat a customer? Or do you feel that an ethics statement needs to be something that's a little different than the mission statement? 
I think it needs to be a little bit different. I mean, I love a good mission statement. However, I think you need to be very, you need to be specific on some of the things that you're holding your employees to, as well as things that you would want your customer to know that your employees will not do. I can't imagine that uh, someone wouldn't like to see a mission statement and ethics as well. So I think that's something we could add to their. Uh, Absolutely. And like I said, I put up on the screen here on the PowerPoint, you can see just, I mean, AFIP has its own code of ethics. I put four. There's, we have what we call them canons, right? So I put four of them up there. So you just can kind of see a little bit of an example of what somebody agrees to when they sign the code of ethics on the AFIP exam. With that being said, do you think there should be a showroom or a an overall experience of ethics throughout all the departments and then one specific to the F&I process? Uh, I think that the dealership, it's, I think any any organization needs to have a, a, an ethics that everybody needs to adhere to. I think when you get into sales and finance and probably service, you have to get very specific. And they, they're probably going to have some items there that accounting or office managers, right, are probably don't, don't need to know about or whether they signed it or not, doesn't matter. But I think you need to have some very specific ethics to sales and finance. Right. Well, when somebody goes goes through AFIP certification, they're going to agree to this code of ethics as part of a, a member of being AFIP certified. So we've already got those covered, and dealers essentially are welcome to use those. But they do need to come up with their own for the other departments, right? As you know, part of a whole complete package. I agree. Maybe having the department heads or somebody that heads up that department as the contact point or an anonymous phone number you know, for each one of those departments, I think would be huge. Correct. Uh, we actually asked, uh, you know, we, we were presenting an opportunity for uh, dealers to go through the compliance through compliance prep. And one of the dealers had asked me why a monthly subscription model for AFIP would be advantageous overdoing their single certification that we know a lot of our dealer partners have done with AFIP. So maybe you guys could elaborate on what you think would be the pluses for being able to go with the monthly subscription over doing the traditional AFIP every two years to say uh, certified as a finance manager. Sure, so you know, over the years, and we've been around for over 30 years now, you know, an individual getting certified, that's great. Okay, but uh, you know, over the years, we're finding that more and more dealers are trying to get geared towards being compliant when it comes to federal and state laws. So we've had lots of folks, they've sent sales, back office, F&I, uh, new and used car managers, GSMs, compliance, legal counsel, even the dealer principal, right? Sometimes are, are attending our trainings as well. So basically what AFIP has done is we've made it more affordable so that everyone can learn the federal and state laws you know, that those dealerships must abide by. So basically each position can get trained and educated on the laws that affect them, right? And their role or responsibility. And then of course, those that are specifically touching a contract, we still want them to get certified. So basically what I'm calling it is uh, dealership compliance exposure. So as you know, and we used to do just a lot of folks that were F&I or those touching a contract, but the back office team, we'd start working with these folks and they'd say, well, you know what, it's really great now that we get some exposure to this. We know the federal or state laws that we're supposed to abide by, that the front end office folks are abiding by. Now, these folks don't necessarily need to be certified, but at least they have exposure to what those state and federal laws are that they're supposed to adhere to. They also now know what the sales department is supposed to be saying or not saying. Right, what F and I is supposed to be saying or not saying, what they're supposed to be doing or not doing when it comes to contracts. So now you're broadening the scope and you're educating folks within the dealership that maybe weren't touched or included before. And then the same thing comes with uh, you know upper management, right? Making sure compliance is involved. Like I said, dealer counsel and even your dealer principal. You know those those dealer principals that are really engaged, they'll actually go through the course because they want to understand for themselves. Hey, what are the rules and requirements? right, that, that uh, my, my team and my folks need to, to have. And then as well as sales personnel, one of the biggest issues has always been turnover, right? So a lot of times dealers will only send their tenured sales folks, which is really good experience for them to go through this, right, to learn these federal rules and, and state laws. Um, but then also not only from a, a turnover standpoint, right, you could eliminate some of that by, you know, keeping your top talent teaching them. So if a salesperson comes in, they don't need to know everything, you know, from an F and I and contract standpoint, but there are key laws and state laws uh, that they need to abide by on a daily basis to do their job and to do it well, you know, as an expert. And so basically, you know, a dealer would be uh, investing in them, 
right? And uh, then it also turns into a career pathing where somebody who comes in, let's say they start off as a salesperson, they have an opportunity to learn those ranks, learn the state rules and regulations, you know, that they have to abide by at sales. They can move up to F&I from F&I if they want to go to management or if they want it to be a compliance officer, right? There's all sorts of movement as they potentially move their way up. And so now we've also got an element of career pathing, right, that they could do as well. And so from a it should, you know, from an exposure standpoint, it just gives everyone within the dealership the opportunity to be exposed to these state and federal laws uh, and fines and rules and regulations so that, again, they can do their job to the best of their ability. But also, this ties into what we were just talking about with your code of ethics. Everybody knows what the other department is doing. Everybody knows what the other department is supposed to be doing. And now they can work cohesively more as a team to protect themselves, to protect each other. And to protect the dealer and at the end of the day that's what we all want right we want to protect our jobs protect our families and and uh, do the you know do the best job we can well and remember when afib started there was no desking managers right finance everything went to finance they presented the numbers they closed the deals they sold the products that's the way it was done so back when we started only f i managers needed the certification we now have desk managers. We have G we have the GSMs early on the process. We have BDC people closing deals. We have so many more people involved into that process that don't understand the rules and regulations. And finance is still the umbrella. They're still there to catch everything. But how many of those decisions are made prior to hitting the finance desk where federal and state rules and regulations need to be applied where training's not provided because of that high turnover rate? That's the purpose of the monthly subscription, is each department has the training that's relevant to what they do. You know, your office managers get 8,300 training. That information's relevant or pertinent to them, and they no longer have to go through the process. And it's frustrating for an organization to send a bunch of BDC people to, it, to the AFIP class. And to be candid with you, they don't have a high pass rate when you start sending people that have never been in finance. So now you're only gonna give them the information that they need and as they move up, they get that additional information. I mean, to your points, I think that it also, for the dealer that's looking to start this, this culture, all of those um, encompassing all the employees, if you will, I think is the fastest way to get everybody on the same page, looking at compliance, making sure that they're doing from a desking, desking standpoint to a service, to a BDC. It's a great way to get everybody involved so that that culture takes over and uh, they can start to move forward you know, in, in a compliant manner. Well, and John, I'm gonna add one more thing that I think that Tevis and I was, we were talking about the advantages. One of the things I just thought about that we missed is during through, going through the whole COVID uh, lockdown and the quarantine, dealers started to do business differently. AFIP quickly put together modules on the cooling off period, modules on how to do an online menu, right? As part of the monthly subscription, that information would have been immediately available to you. So what we're looking for is what's changing in the industry, what are the hot topics, and we're trying to get that information out quickly so dealers have it. So if you're on that monthly subscription service, you have that information the minute we make it available. Uh, last year, we did a lot of payment packing, straw deals, not teaching you how to do it, but why you should not do those things. And we put that information out there pretty quickly once we saw several dealers got hit pretty big, that information was available right away. On that monthly subscription model, you have access to that right away, not in two years when you come back to recertify. Very good point, very good point. Do we have some questions in regards to uh, this monthly versus doing uh, you know, the every two years? I think we made some great points here, but maybe something that you could see from one of your dealers. Uh, any questions at all? Yeah, you know, I, I see it's more of a comment. Um, dealers that, um, train for annual training uh, federal annual training requirements on certain f regulations will say yeah we trained on red flags or we trained on uh do not call do not email or uh, safeguards disposal rule and uh, and then when you ask them if it's logged or if they've written down the training or, or taken some kind of measures to record the training you can't find it right so so i i think this is also a great way to um hold accountable those training requirements. 
not only that, but also for a dealer to be able to see, right, who's been doing what and if they've completed what they need to. There's always got to be that level of reporting, right, and uh, responsibility factor. And will will the modules um, provide the um, satisfaction of those training requirements annually for red flags and all of those uh, items? Correct. There is red flags and safeguard training on there. We're so right now you have the AFib red flag safeguard. We are loading up the actual training that does the checklist as well. So you will have both versions on there. You'll have the checklist training as well as AFib's version, which goes to the next level. That's something that they could print off. Uh, that there's been a success, a successful course goes into their employee file, and you know for that year that that employee's. Uh, on their, their due diligence yeah, so cards by flex. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I got the Zoom meeting. Any other questions out there? Left side, then I got the meeting ID and all that. Yes, so I did that thing and download all this shit. I can't download it. There's a little bit of feedback there. Um, any other Any other questions out there? Um, I think there was a question in the chat box going back to um, Guy. Guy, you had mentioned if uh, I guess this is in reference to the single document rule, Guy. Yeah, I sent with- I sent Guy a message, an email. I told him to give me a call. We got some state specific stuff on California that him and I can go over. I I just sent him my cell phone number. Awesome. If you're Very okay, good. that's a. I think that there's a that that's a better question offline because a lot of it depends on the DMS they're using, right? Not all the systems are set up to accommodate what California needs. So I, I have some follow-up questions as well. Awesome. Um, any other questions out there? All right, so, I'm sorry? It's a good stuff. Yeah, definitely good stuff. Um, so I think our takeaway last week was uh, creating a risk assessment in the dealership, finding out you know where the important parts are uh, for us to start with from a dealer level, um, looking at maybe the first three things that you could tackle pretty quickly and, and get that culture started. Um, I think this week the takeaways are um, the ability for a dealership to get almost started in the standpoint of being able to uh, create a culture pretty pretty quickly with a monthly subscription. You know, we've we've discussed code of ethics, which I think is my biggest takeaway, and, and how to make sure that all of our stores are displaying it and making sure that that culture exists. And I think to the point of your top ten, I think it's important to get everyone involved there, so that especially if you're one of the people that have mentioned one of these compliance rules that we're going to make uh, active or in place you know that you're going to be that individual that makes sure that that's policed and uh, everyone's on the same page as far as that's concerned. And I, I don't know, what do you think some of the takeaways from today's information should be from a dealer level, just to, again, to continue that compliance uh, outlook and make sure that you get that culture going in your store? So I, I think the first one is start to put a policy together. Like, start. let's actually put an action plan together, right? This, okay. this is fun to talk about but let's actually put an action plan together, right? Let's let's put together, let's get a meeting, let's talk about what our code of ethics need to be, let's talk about how we're gonna implement those, how we're gonna train, how's that, you know, making sure everybody reads and signs them. I think it, the next step is put a game plan together. How are you gonna do it? We're gonna send, I'll send, I'll include some information on ethics versus value statements and how, you, you know, what are some advantages of each. But to me, that's the takeaway. We can talk about this stuff all day long, but nothing changes until you actually put it into place. The second thing, and I hate to say this, but you got to be honest about your organization, right? No dealership's perfect. We know that. Every dealership, if you audit long enough, you'll find a mistake. So you have to be honest with your organization and know the areas that you need to focus, right? You have to hold each other accountable and you have to be able to train. A lot of times dealers that that do things that kind of skirt the gray line is because they don't take the time to train them how to do it right. And they don't, they're afraid there's gonna be a loss of income. So if you're gonna put the ethics in place, be honest about your organization, know the areas that you have to provide some training 
if there's going to be some changes that need to be made. Do you think it's a good practice to get all of your employees to sign that code of ethics if you don't already have one displayed and just make sure that your employees are on board that this is the way we're moving forward? Compliance Absolutely. is something that's really, really important to us. We Absolutely. want to make sure that you take care of our clients the way that we would expect you to. And this is going to be the, the direction moving forward. Absolutely. I mean, I, I there are uh, quite a few organizations out there that have actually had called us and said, we have somebody who's violated the A5P code of ethics. Uh, we'd like to get a copy of that because we're going to use, we're going to terminate this employee. And not only did they do some things that are violate our rules, but we want to reinforce it that this, they also agreed to not do these things when they took the exam. Right. So it helps you reinforce the rules and in areas where maybe termination is the only step you have that reinforcement as well from an HR standpoint. I think it also uh, applauds the dealer who's actually, you know, taking the the, the necessary steps and, and is aware that he's violated it, has reached out to AFIP. It shows to me that the dealer, you know, certainly if there was uh, prosecution down the line or whatever the case may be, you know, it shows the dealer's done the right thing. So I think that's another way of insulating yourself against uh, a rogue employee, if you will. Oh, absolutely. It's the due diligence all over again. Right. And my speech on the rogue employees, you, there's no way to stop a rogue employee. Every every industry has times where you hire one. The only way you eliminate that is a good code of ethics and creating a culture where you hold each other accountable and those actions are not tolerated. Well, when an employee signs off on that, then they know what's expected from the get go as well. Right. So it kind of frames out. Here's what I'm required to adhere to. The standards or the policies and things that I have to follow and if I'm not going to do that then I don't need to be here otherwise if I do want to be here I sign off and I agree to those things and I uphold those yeah I think it's a great takeaway and, and, and again to Shannon's point you know it all starts with actually getting uh, getting this action plan um, rolling and I think that's uh, where some dealers have the fall downs and I think this is uh, an awesome way for them to Get, every, get everybody involved with this monthly subscription and, and I'm all for it. I, I've seen uh, already some of my dealers taking advantage of it and they, uh, they're that they speaking volumes about the way that it allows not only their employees to stay on site, which was another uh, difficult thing with the with the testing off site, but not only that, uh, getting everybody involved and, and the ability to fast track some of their employees that they know would be good managers that they feel would, they'd have longevity with and be less turnover with, you know, and all those things I think uh, uh, you guys have really done a great job with. And uh, it's, it's moving with uh, with the industry too. The industry's going in a di little different direction, but uh, being able to do offsite deliveries and understand how that works, all these things to me are uh, fantastic points. And uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. If there's any questions out there, please guys, uh, you know, ask away. Thank you all. Thank you guys, we appreciate it. It was great information, thank you.